another weekly live with yours truly, Dr. Sarah L. Webb. Um, I go live every Tuesday at two o'clock Central Time. And today we have another special guest, the founder of the organization Own Your I Am, Raven Roberts, is going to be joining us. So Own Your I Am is another organization seeking to empower women of color around issues of colorism. And so I look forward to, I have some questions prepared, but of course I'll be taking questions from the audience. And while we wait for Raven to join us, as always, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, Akosawa, good to see you. <laughs> I got an um, email from your friend about the, the radio show, so I'm excited about that. Um, hey folks, oh, there you go. Okay, so be sure to drop your name and your location in the chat. I always like to know where people are tuning from, tuning in from. So I will bring you on. And hopefully you'll, you should be able to hear us, I think, on Facebook. But if you are on, I, if you do have an Instagram account, I recommend you join us there. Hey, Raven. Hello. How are hey. you? Uh, good. I love how the hair is all out today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, we just let it free. Just let it free. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There you go. All right. Um, so we have some folks tuning in from London. Hey, Marley Yay. Bob. Good to see you. Um, let's see who else is here. Dark Woman and Girls 365. Hey, I know where you are located. New Jersey. Laughter at Attracts Joy. I like that screen name. Laughter Attracts Joy. Um, we have I Am Shanda Rule from Vienna. Welcome. I gotta get you on here too one of these days. Um, Philadelphia, PA. Very nice. Very nice. So we have our international crowd as usual. Yeah. Um, hey, Priscilla, what's up? from Stafford, Texas. So I'm also live on Facebook, Raven. Okay. If you see me reading comments that you don't see on the screen <laughs> is that there are folks tuning in on Facebook as well. Um, all right, so let's get started. Um, I did post your bio and all that on the page, but not everyone might have read it. So please take a second to just introduce yourself briefly and we'll dive in. And folks who are tuning in, we are gonna take questions. So yes. keep that in mind as you listen to Raven talk today. Okay, so my name is Raven Roberts. I am the founder of Own Your I Am um, by trade or my career and job, shall I say, is I'm a celebrity wardrobe stylist and content creator. Um, I founded Own Your I Am in 2019. It is to empower Black women to own who they say they are and not what the world says about them. And we are striving to erase the lines of colorism and the social injustice that comes from it. Yay! I like how you have it succinct and it's just like ready to go. That's awesome. Because I'm like, I, I used to get tripped up like, uh, uh, so I was like, we need to have this automatic, it's the right. same every time. Like, what do you do? This is what we do, okay? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so fashion styles, as people who are watching, um, you see Raven is very stylish. Every time I see you live, I'm like, yes, I love the jewelry and everything. It's working for me. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. <laughs> yes. Hello, Chicago and LA. What's up, y'all? Yeah, come on, LA. I'm an LA native. Come on, LA. <laughs> um, so I would like to start with a similar question that I always start with everybody when I bring them on is how did you become aware of this issue called colorism, right? So not how did you when did you hear about the word colorism? Yeah. But what brought to your awareness that there was an issue around skin tone and complexion? Ooh, I'm like, I'm trying to remember when it was like pinpointed. I remember, of course, growing up as a dark skinned woman, just always feeling there was something wrong with my skin complexion and feeling less than. So I knew that there was an issue there of just feeling as though like, I wasn't as worthy or I wasn't enough or as beautiful or desirable as my lighter skin counterparts. Um, I think where I really was like, okay, something needs to be done about this is when I watched uh, Dark Girls, I think for the first or second time. And I think everyone, especially dark women, have like that person that resonated with them um, the most. Because all the stories I was like, yep, uh-huh, 
been through that. Yep, that <laughs> happened. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. But it was, and this is one of the reasons why I started the organization or just kind of the inception of even thinking about starting the organization. There was a woman on there who just talked about how like her mom went on and on about how smart she was, how this and this and this and this she was. And then very end, she was just like, if she had any lightness to her skin and I think in that moment, it hit me that there are women out here who do not have that foundation at home. Um, and I just thought, I was like, where would I be if I didn't have my mom telling me that I was beautiful? Like, I didn't always believe her, trust and believe, because I was like, ma'am, you're insane. But because my mother is lighter than I am. But I was just like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, you're weird. Like, why would you want to be my complexion? But it, I just thought in that moment, like, if I did not have her even trying to instill that in me like where would I be today you know mm -hmm. so I was like I don't want any other woman child or anything like that to go through that if they don't have it in their household you know like we mm -hmm. need to stop these generational curses of passing this on generation to generation yes absolutely and so I, I'm looking at this comment here from uh, Michelle Henry saying living in the UK, but can totally relate to everything she's hearing as a dark skinned woman. So exactly what you're saying, there are a lot of us out there um, going through this. And mm -hmm. I, I completely resonate with what you said. Like, even those of us who have affirming households, who had parents who were telling us we were beautiful, right, still struggle. Yeah. And so to know that there are Black women out there and other women of different races, too, who don't have that on top yeah. of the social pressure of colorism, I absolutely can attest to that. And it's interesting because Dark Girls, seeing that um, documentary and even just seeing the previews for it, like even before I watched it, seeing the previews was like what gave me the courage to write my first blog post. I was like, okay, yes. somebody else said it first. Now I can kind of like... <laughs> Chime in and add to like, I can, I can jump out there now. I can jump out. <laughs> right. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so I think there's an interesting opportunity to, to have you here as like a celebrity stylist, because a lot of people are curious, right, about colorism in sort of media and entertainment industry, right? And we, yeah. we see it so being so prevalent there. So having a much more insider perspective than I, than me and like a lot of the people watching would ever have. How do you see it playing out in terms of, you know, interactions you've had either, not, and not just on camera, because a lot of times when we talk about colorism in media, we, a lot of us have to rely on what we see on camera, right? But yeah. even knowing that other things might be happening that we don't see in the final cut. Um, yeah. So from your perspective, how does it play out in your field? Um, it plays out in so many different ways. Like you said, in front and behind the camera, like there's only so much that you guys see is like a final result. So we'll start with that. It's just like the final result. There's a lot of what we call, I guess, um, I think it's called whitewashing where we'll get people who are lighter. So I remember this was like very vivid. I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard um, and I looked up and I was like, who is that white woman? She looked like Beyonce. It was Beyonce. So this is what happened. <laughs> like, I legit was like, that's the first thing. I, I was like, who is this white wow. woman? And I was like, she kind of looked like Beyonce. And I said, oh, that is Beyonce. Because they had lightened her skin <laughs> so much, she uh -huh. looked Caucasian, you know? And they mm -hmm. do that with every Black person. So you'll see Lupita, and then they'll lighten her skin in post. Or, you know, you'll see a picture of Serena, and then they lighten their skin in post. Like, we've all seen the things of, like, Carrie Washington and then she's like it's like wait a minute and people are thinking that they're bleaching their skin or like oh you bleached your skin it's like no this person lightened my photos um so that's what happens on like the editing room and everything like that um behind the scenes you see a lot of makeup artists who don't know how to do darker skin tones um I've been on set with people where They'll just look at a model and be like, oh, your skin is perfect. You can go out. No makeup, no nothing. Like, they're just like, oh, you're fine. And then their person's sitting there like, but you didn't touch my face. You didn't put nothing on my face. And there are a ton of models who have amazing, flawless skin. But sometimes you just need a little something. But a lot of times they'll use that as the default because they don't have the shade or they don't know how to match the shade. Um... And you really only see that on the darker hue spectrum. Um, and you'll see this on photo shoots. You'll see this at, uh, we've all seen the articles or I don't know if you're not in the industry, maybe you haven't, but 
where a lot of models have to bring their own makeup to shows or to shoots because the makeup artist isn't just going to have their shade. Um, I've been on the other side of this doing like content creation and um, being in a few commercials and just worrying about if there was someone who could do my hair you know like I've been in hair commercials and I had to do my own hair because I was like I don't wow you know what I'm saying like I can't trust you and literally sitting because you know with the process of a commercial you have to go back like so many times and they have to like see your hair and do all this other stuff so one of the times that I went I'm literally sitting there with the hairstylist teaching her how to twist my hair so like I'm having to do it. I'm also having to teach her. She ain't doing it right. So I'm having to redo what she doing. And people are like, oh my gosh, your hair looks amazing. I was like, I know I did it. Like you're not about to have me out here looking crazy. <laughs> okay? Like, yes. no ma'am, no sir. So a lot of black models have to go through that where they either have to do their own hair or they have to show up and like pretty much everything that I've been on that has a hair makeup team. I asked them in advance, like, who's doing the hair makeup? Like, I got to make sure. I've had one time where they actually had a black makeup artist, which was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. He wasn't that great with hair. Love him to death. But he just, he couldn't do natural hair because not everyone can do natural hair. So thankfully, mm -hmm. they cut out the scenes mm -hmm. where he had pinned my hair up. But everything else was fine. I was like, it, it's almost like a sigh of relief when you walk in and you see someone who looks like you and you're like, you're gonna know how to do my makeup. I trust that you're you're not gonna have me out here looking like a ghost. Okay? Because you just don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. That little like that ashy look, you know, or like you yeah, faded. I feel you. you know um, what I'm saying? It's like it's not because... blending. It's something it's not right. <laughs> And it feels like that should be, you know, in terms of competency, like you should, and when they're looking for to hire people, like that should be considered a more competent person. Like, can you do all skin tones, right? Because if not, you can't really consider yourself a professional, you know, it seems no, to me, but that's just me. They don't, like I was on a, sh well, I did a, a, like a fashion show, it was like a live fashion show thing um, that was like live streamed in a commercial or something, but... I asked the person who hired me, I said, who's doing the hair? Do they know how to do my type of hair? And she's mm -hmm. like, oh, he's like a world-renowned hairstylist. Say less. I got it. I'm going to show up with my hair done. They had, and they had, like, because they normally have, like, a team of people that come up there. So they had a team of people. The person who was doing my hair was an Asian woman who cannot speak English. So she does not know how to do my hair. She doesn't. You know what I'm saying? They had, I think, like, one or two black hairstylists. The show itself was super diverse. Super, mm -hmm. Tons mm -hmm. of black women, everything like that. But when your back of house is not diverse, it doesn't matter what the front of house is because every black woman who was there was like, I don't feel seen. No one could do my hair. My makeup looks trash. Like everyone has to get, like everyone was doing their makeup in the bathroom because of the people who could not do their makeup. And I had a person of color do my makeup and I looked. I had to go in the bathroom and fix it because I was like, what is this? Like, this look mm -hmm. crazy. And you over here and the yeah. hair artist signed off on it. It was like, she looks great. Who, who are we looking at? So, <laughs> this is And I'm I wondering did. if, um, so I am Shanda Rule says, uh, okay, but makeup for dark women is a new thing though. And I agree, it's only recently that they've even had shades for all the skin tones. But that's the problem in itself because dark women yeah. have not been new, okay? So like <laughs> makeup for dark women is a new thing, but not every place did not have dark makeup. So mm -hmm. yes, it is a new thing, but dark skin people are not new. Dark skin women yeah. didn't just start wearing makeup. No, Naomi Campbell been wearing true. makeup since the 90s. Okay, like... Mm. So just because we have Fenty now doesn't mean that we can discount the fact that you need to know how to do makeup when there's Naomi's and there's all these other women and the Ajax, you know what I'm saying? Ajax yeah. is to me, okay? And been in the industry forever. You should know how to do dark skin makeup. There's so many like professional makeup lines that go the shade range. 
we just don't have access to them. So it's it's mm -hmm. not like there's no excuse in the fashion industry to not know how to do dark skin makeup. There is none because there's so many opportunities to get the makeup. There's a Pat McGrath. There's all of these different places that have the makeup or at least have two, three shades. A lot of these people don't even have those shades. And it's not that the companies don't make them. Trust. Because you can, whatever you get gotcha. at Walgreens, gotcha. if you go on, on covergirl.com, they got about 50 more shades. It's Walgreens that buys gotcha. the shades. Yeah. It's CBS that buys the shades. It's mm -hmm. not that they don't have them. It's just that they don't buy them, so they don't put them on the shelf. But if you go to the mm -hmm. actual manufacturer's like website, like covergirl.com, you will see all the in-between shades. You will see more shades on there. So the gotcha. shades... I'm not going to say they have the hugest shade range because we all know they got about 65 beiges and still only 15 grams. <laughs> but there's still yeah. no excuse to not know how to do black makeup in 2019. Okay? Because this is when yeah. this if you, especially if you're Especially if you are a professional makeup artist, right? We're not talking about your cousin trying to use her palette in her bathroom. We're talking about people who get paid to be able to do this for anybody. We're, and the people that I'm speaking of have been in the industry 10, 15, 20 years. So wow. these aren't like yeah. new people, like you said, like, oh, I've been doing makeup like for a year. These are people who are like w world renowned, been in the industry mm -hmm. for 10, 15, 20 years and don't know how to do makeup. Don't know how to do, you know, I can understand natural hair. Natural hair is a new wave. Natural hair is a new thing. You may not all know how to do it. But once you see enough people mm -hmm. come up on set, you might want to take a course. You might want to brush up and yeah. figure out how to get this natural hair done. But they don't do it because it's not expected of them. They just don't, mm -hmm. they don't care to learn and expand beyond that. Exactly. Point. They're just like, I'm yes. fine. And right. the industry doesn't it's, make they don't do want they don't care. No. They don't care to, to learn. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. No. Um face to gram says I don't even want to think about the myriad of dark skinned women we're not seeing on TV, all because people can't do their jobs right. That's an interesting point. Um so, so this is why people that, are so like we'll making kind of, sure they're getting people hired. Like mm -hmm. Susan Kalechi, she was like my hair needs to be natural. We need to have someone who knows how to do natural hair and all of these things. Because she's like, y'all not about to have me out here looking crazy. Mm -hmm. You're not. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I am sure she made a hashtag of what you said. You might want to take a course. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good hashtag. We're going to use hey. that and tag all the, the TV shows. Like, y'all might want to take a course. <laughs> Um, so, but what have you seen people do? Like, has there been advocacy? Are people like working to change that? So like, we know that that's the issue, but are there anything, is there anything that people have been doing to try to make change in that area? So my friend has an organization called Models of Color Matter and it's dual focus or like multi-focus, shall I say. Part of it is to get more black and brown faces um, in the industry, period, as far as models are concerned, because if you ever go to a modeling website, they will, again, have a thousand white people, and then they'll be like, here's our five black people, we got two Asians, and boom, diversity. So she's trying to get more brown and um, people of color out there on the runways, casted for um, ads and campaigns and all of those things but another thing that she's also trying to do is to make it easier for makeup artists like she's trying to make this foolproof because she's just like y'all clearly are not being proactive so let me let me make this real easy for you um and she's working on creating like a technology that will send everyone's shades to the makeup artist before they arrive so you can look at it and say like okay so i know i'm gonna have five girls that are this shade and then it matches it to the makeup that matches their skin tone so it takes the guesswork wow. out of it for the makeup artist yeah. um because she's she's worked backstage she's worked in the fashion industry she's actually a fashion publicist so she does a lot of um shows and new york fashion week and all of that stuff producing them so she's seen the gambit. She's seen more than I have, you know? So she's just like, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Like, this is insane. Because 
it's just not fair. You know what I'm saying? Like we have to show up and not be able to get our hair done, not be able to get our makeup done because people are incompetent. And you have to think of when you have a staff of like 10 makeup artists and none of them can do your makeup or only one person on there can do black makeup, that's a problem. Like, we're not talking about one-off people. We're not talking about, oh, there's one person behind the scenes. There's one person um, at this commercial or whatever. Like, usually there's a team of people. And if no one on your team can do black makeup, again, hashtag, you got to take a course. Like, it's just <laughs> the numbers are not there to justify why the makeup isn't being done. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if it was a one-on-one yeah. -on -one thing, Sometimes you could understand, but because it happens more often than not, especially for Black models, whether they are on set for uh, just an editorial where it is a one-on-one -on -one thing or if they're behind the scenes at a fashion show, it just is a recurring thing in the fashion industry, and it's been that way for years. So it just needs to stop. Yeah, and it's funny because I, uh, I did one extra gig when I was living in New Orleans for uh, Queen Sugar. I mean, I'm sure it's different too for extras, right? Like I'm not yeah. even trying to put it on the same level of what you're talking about. But when I went up to the makeup counter, they looked at my face and they're like, oh, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said that, I was like, oh, maybe that was their excuse. But I don't think so because it's Queen Sugar. So they had like a lot of black people as extras. So I'm like, they probably really just thought I was okay to go. Um, but that was so interesting that I actually literally heard those same words. Like, oh, your, your, your face is fine. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, and a lot of people think that it's okay on like black sets but mm -hmm. sometimes it's not too you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. like I have a friend who works in the costume department the people who make the decisions or try to pass on decisions are white and they constantly have to fight with them like black people wouldn't wear this like this is not what black people will wear yeah. so if you have someone who yeah. is Caucasian or who doesn't know how to do let's say natural hair because not every black person know how to do natural hair let's keep it real mm -hmm. you're not going to get true that expertise you're not going to understand versus someone who's like I don't know natural hair but I know that like two out of my three actresses are going to have natural hair let me make sure I either bring an assistant on who knows how to do natural hair or I at least watch a YouTube video something so yeah. I know what to do and how to take care of it but a lot of people just they don't do it because they're just like I ain't got to I got this far exactly yes and I feel like because those, the women on that set were, they were black makeup artists and, you know, black hairstylists and things mm -hmm. like that. But when you said not all black people know how to do natural hair, I think that's always something I try to remind people is that we can't always assume that just because mm -hmm. black people are in the room that natural hair or darker skin tones are going to be treated fairly or have equal representation too. So, yeah. Because um, a lot of times we think, oh, well, it's just, we need, um, more black people in these spaces, but I think we need more anti-colorist people in these spaces, right? Because we know sometimes I think about that Rick Ross clip that went viral about him choosing the light-skinned singer over the dark-skinned singer. I'm like, sometimes it is black people who are making colorist choices. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm like, we didn't um, create it, but we perpetuate it. And that's just what it do. is. Yeah, we do. Um, so I kind of want to talk about um, On Your I Am some more. And you kind of gave us an insight into the origin story and how you were inspired to do that. So if there's anything else about the inception of that idea and the founding of it, but also like what are some challenges to doing that kind of work, to having an organization that caters to this specific issue? Um, so first, of all, we I made sure that like I really wanted to create representation in like multiple spaces. So we have several areas on our website for, um, especially like I love our bookshelf, like I don't have any kids, but like I love referring um, people with especially young children to our bookshelf because it has so many different types of books for women of color um, who have children. Basically like all the regular fairy tales, there's ones on how to love your natural hair, there's you know, just different ones on skin tone and representation, but it puts a black girl in like Cinderella, Cinderella shoes so that they can see someone who looks like them in these stories and you don't have to go out and seek it. Like I just wanted it all to be in one area so people could just click, click, add to cart, click, click, and it's all on Amazon. 
So if you got the prime, you know what I'm saying, two-day shipping. But um, we just wanted it to be very simple for people to have a resource to go and get that. Um, and as you mentioned on your live with Edlin, we actually share colorism stories. So we have um, a form on our website where there's like a questionnaire that I feel that I created that you can fill out to share your stories with colorism. Um, and it talks about like, when did you first realize colorism existed? You know, what do you think we can do to combat it? And so we share those. It asks you for some pictures. So we share those on the website and then also on our page. Like we're, we're new, but we're not new because it was like 2019, but you know, 2020 was craziness. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, okay, we've been around two years, but really one. Um, but those things are on there. So we don't have a ton of people who have submitted. So if you guys would love to share your stories, um, I created that so that other women could understand and see other women going through what they also go through. Um, so it's not having to be like, okay, come on live and share your story. It could be very just like simple, go at your own pace, fill out the form. Um, and having the events, it's definitely been a little bit more difficult, um, especially with, everybody being at home, but we're trying to do more lives. And now that we can do the group lives, that's like amazing. Cause I was like, we have a whole little panel. I was like, this is cute. Mm -hmm. um, but it is hard. Like when I first started, it was just me. Thankfully, like the God led, God led me to Edlin because I live in New York at the time. He lives in Florida. Like this man, you've met Edlin, but he just was like, so I want to help you. I was like, or what? Hey. <laughs> no, you ain't never met in person. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, to this day, I've only met him in person once. So it's not like me and Edlin spent mm -hmm. all this time together, but we've grown to do life together, even in separate states. So I would say definitely reach out to people online. Like, if you're starting something, don't just think in your like immediate circle in your town of people who can do stuff like right next to you or in person with you, branch out. Um, Cause I just cold emailed him to ask him to read some of his stuff. And then he was like, Hey, I would love to write for the blog. And I was like, okay, I guess. And then he was like, I want to do more stuff. I was like, okay, like sure. I will give you more to do. Okay. <laughs> um, That's so funny. <laughs> I was just like, cause I didn't, I didn't think that I was like, no one's really helping me with this. I just got to do it and figure it out. Um, but it, he's been a huge blessing. He, you know, has been very patient with me in times where I'm just like, what am I doing? What's going on? Um, and just, you know, been there pretty much every step of the way because I started the organiz organization in May. I think I reached out to him in June. So like, he's been here since I launched. Um, I was definitely doing research and stuff like that beforehand, but those are, that was probably one of the biggest things. And then just learning how to talk to people about colorism who don't believe that it exists. Uh -huh. that... <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Cause I want to know <laughs> when I tell you that is the most frustrating thing. Like I get so heated. <laughs> and so I have to like rein myself back. Like, okay, Raven, like calm down. Cause like, um, cause I've, I've been on, my friend had like a zoom call with like a bunch of different people from all over places. And we were talking mm -hmm. about colorism, um, because one of his daughters is light skin, one of his daughters is dark skin. So he was like, okay. we, we really need to talk about this because I need to know how are they going to grow up and how are they going to grow up differently? So we all had like a collective conversation and it was just like, Part I, it just feels like you're talking to a brick wall sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, and you're just trying to explain these things of like why it's beyond. Just feel pretty. <laughs> Sorry, like, <laughs> just why I, are you? I why do you not feel pretty in my soul? I felt that in my soul, <laughs> and I know. <laughs> Like, if people just think it's that easy, like, well, if you don't feel pretty, that's your problem, not mine. And I'm like, do you not I, understand that it's I'm way beyond you. this? And it's not just that. And so if anybody understands or doesn't really understand colorism who's on this call, like, talking to people about colorism who don't believe it exists is like talking to people about racism 
who don't believe it exists. So you can talk yeah. to them like there is a such thing as light skin privilege. But I had to work and I had to do it. Nobody you are you, you are spilling all the tea. You saying no, everything. No one is saying you did it. I experienced racism. Yes. Oh, boop, 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 boop. Calm down. <laughs> Slow your brakes. Nobody. I didn't yes. say that. No one. No one said that. So it becomes this very defensive thing that I didn't really have yes. to experience because, like everyone that I had conversation with, everyone who came to our events in person they all like admitted that this was a thing like they all were there to like gain information to really talk about it or to seek healing from it so to be in a conversation with someone who like blatantly was like this is not a thing da, 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 da. and then it was funny because one of the women who said that her mom came on the call and she was like no this seriously is a thing like this was in housing and this was in this and i was like <laughs> I'm gonna need you to listen to your mama who's sitting next to you. So I'm gonna need your mama to say it one more time because you out here yes. trying to act like it don't exist. So yes. it was just, you know, you get all of the well, dark skinned women, they don't like me and da 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 and it's like you you just have to it's a lot of yeah, breathing. Yeah. It's a lot of heavy breathing, it's a lot of woo sighing, it's a lot of just yeah. Okay, take a step back, count to five. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not saying that we say this all the time on our lives, like the light skin experience with colorism is very real. We're never trying to negate that side of the spectrum. Literally how I put it in the, the, the like group call that we did was if light skin problems are like Lake Michigan, dark skin problems are the Grand Canyon. We're not saying that you don't have issues. We're saying that ours are a lot more vast and a little bit wider. That's what we're saying. So it's not that it, you had a smooth road, smooth sailing the whole time. There's definitely issues. Right. We're just saying that we have more. Just like black people say we got more issues than white people. That's all we say. That's all we say. So yes, yes. I, it's so refreshing. It's actually refreshing to hear you talk about your frustrations because <laughs> I know I go through it. And you kind of like, am I am I losing my mind? Like, am I insane? Like, you really say things, having you an get stats, and you're like, are you not hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth? And then someone else says, and they're like, oh, I get it. Literally, I had I had a, was on a panel on Sunday, and I was talking about all the systemic inequalities between light skin and dark skin saying how employment inequality job inequality and within the justice system inequality and then somebody came up throwing shade like intentionally throwing shade right talking about well you know white folks want us to talk about what light skin people have and dark skin people don't have i like but that's i'm describing a reality like that's not just me like trying to pick a fight like i'm not just on here trying to stir the pot like I'm describing a reality and it's just because you don't like it doesn't mean. <laughs> but it's also like if you say that white people don't want us to discuss it, white people also don't want us to discuss racism. Okay, these same white people who don't want us to discuss colorism don't want us to discuss racism. Mm -hmm. And if they do want us to discuss racism and they bring everyone up, if we don't discuss colorism, the colorism still exists. So just because you're equal as a light skin counterpart does not mean that I'm going to be equal as a dark skin counterpart. So like you're fighting for Say your it. quality and then you're leaving me behind. So don't be like the white women Say with it. feminism and leave the black people behind. Okay? So. Yes. 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 Let's just <laughs> sit on that. Okay. Um, I like this comment here from I am Chandru. There's also pretty privilege. Mm -hmm. And I feel the whole not feeling pretty is trivialized on both sides. Loved how this was addressed in hood feminism. Okay, so we dropping um book recommendations too. But yeah, <clears throat> like even if people think it's just about being pretty, right? So people are surprised that like it affects, you know, your education, your employment, your health outcomes. Mm -hmm. But let's say, for example, if we just focus on the pretty part. Like that also impacts your ability to get a job, your ability to be treated fairly in the justice system. Like pretty privilege is a real thing too. So but, yeah. And it also like, if you are deemed less pretty, as we know, darker skinned women get married at a lesser rate 
or a lower rate than their lighter skin counterparts. So that also affects your um, ability to accumulate wealth. So now we're talking about like mm -hmm. the financial situation because now you yes. have a two income household versus a one income household. So I'm like, if it's yeah. just about financial being stability, pretty, you need to talk Come to on. your, your uh, brothers over here about also making sure that I feel pretty and that I feel <laughs> like, because it's not just me. Yes. And then even looking into how, like, when they say, oh, just feel pretty. So those, the girls, the people, the people who grow up feeling pretty, like, they also didn't just wake up feeling pretty. They are a allowed to feel that way because society has treated them a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're looking at dark skin women and saying, like, oh, you just need to love yourself, just feel pretty but not acknowledging that for lighter skinned women, like it also didn't just happen. Like they were supported in that. Like they yep. were told that they were. It's the reason why they can, right? So yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about this in our um, Texturism Live, Evelyn and I, mm -hmm. because when it comes to texturism, like I'm on the privileged side when it comes to black hair. And I totally recognize that. I can't be like, no, I have no privilege whatsoever. When it comes to hair, there is a privilege there. And I recognize that and I can own that. I can't be like, no, like, because I'm a dark skinned woman. I just, 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 like, I own that on texturism, I have privilege. You know, I've always had long hair, I've always had wavy texture hair. Like, that's just been what it is. So I can't relate to the little black girls whose hair fell out because of the perm. I can't relate to certain mm -hmm. things. And, but, just like, you know, how people are like, oh, I got teased. I got teased a lot because of my hair, because it was long, because it was out, because it was thick. Like, that's just what happened. But I can't be like, oh, woe is me. I had it the worst. Like, no. Like, I still can recognize my privilege even though I was teased, even though I was hurt by people teasing me because of my hair. I can still recognize that, you know, I have a privilege when it comes to this. And it's so insane that like us as black people this is our mentality to think like if you're a black woman with long hair you must be mixed like that is the most oh, infuriating oh. comment or question yes. that i get all yes. the time people are like are you mixed i'm like do i look mixed <laughs> do i do ma'am do i look mixed my hair is just long i'm sorry that's just what it is and especially when it's in a twist out or something people are like oh my gosh or, i'm not mixed it's not, it's not a thing. You trying to make a thing that's not a thing. 100% yes. black, don't even go there. You know what I'm saying? But right. it's just sad that that's what our mentality and where our mind goes as black people because we've been conditioned to think that especially dark-skinned black women cannot grow hair. So if you're dark-skinned yes. and you have longer hair, you must be mixed with something else. You can't be full black. Yep. And, it's like, and you know what it is, though? You know what I hear, Raven? It's because um, dark-skinned women with, like, a looser curl patterns, right? Because they don't, quote-unquote, look the tradition. They don't have the traditionally mixed look of being lighter-skinned, but they'll say things like, oh, well, I have Native American heritage. That's why I'm darker. But my hair is, you know, straight, right? Because I'm mixed with, like, Native American or something like that. And you know, I'm not so, yes, black, there are black people with Native American heritage, but it is that still that assumption that black people can't look all kind of ways, right? If you go to our continent, we had all types of hairstyles, hair texture, even facial features, right? Mm -hmm. even, even the size and shapes of our noses and lips varied yep. widely across the continent, you know what I mean? Um, we have a, our first question, which is great. Yay. Um, but a lot of people just talking about how you speak in truth on here. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Anna BSW. Yeah, we called out that light skin privilege for sure. Um, but let's see what this question is. Is there a psychological human need to not own privilege? Ooh. Also, we need a checklist of these talking points. <laughs> It'll be recorded. It's going to be recorded. In I'm like, somebody somebody needs to be taking the notes. Um, <laughs> I think that it is a thing to where, I don't know if it's an American thing or what, but we tend to have, not everyone, but it, seems to, it tends to be like a victim mentality anytime that privilege is brought up. 
Yeah. Because it's like, but no, I did this. But no, I had to work hard for this. But no, I had to do this. And you see this with mm-hmm. white people. You see it just yeah. across the board of like, yeah. but I had to apply for college. Ain't nobody saying you had, you didn't have to apply. Like, where in the world, other than the scandal, you know what I'm saying? Did you yeah. have to apply yeah. to college? Like, that don't even. Yeah. Just because some white people could pay to get into college don't mean that every other white person doesn't have to apply, you know? So it's a need to just be the victim and to be relatable in a sense of like, well, no, I'm like you because I also had to do this. And it's Mm -hmm. like, but you also didn't have to have universities created so that you could go to school. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that you could get an education. Your ancestors did not need that. So people don't always recognize that there's historical things. Like people think that history is done, that there is no effects of historical practices or anything like that in today's society. So they're just like, well, no, these things don't exist because that was back then. I've had family members who have been like, why are you talking about colorism? It's not a thing anymore. (laughs) <laughs> how, how, is it, how is it not <laughs> like right, oh my gosh. right you know so they don't fully understand especially the older mm-hmm. generation but then also some younger people it's like well the blue vein society was like back in the day it's like yeah but that created economic status that darker skin counterparts did not have so that trickled down generation to generation to generation when you had mm-hmm. redlining you also had redlining amongst skin color and skin tone so like these are not just like oh we all have redlining we did but it also took it a step further where only certain light-skinned people were allowed to live in certain neighborhoods and you can think of the Harlems. you can think of all of these great black neighborhoods in history a lot of them did redlining for darker skinned people so it's not that like oh my gosh the harlem renaissance was amazing yes but it also had a whole light-skinned community that was living up in Harlem. Oh, yes. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so yes. This is what it is of just being like, that was then, this is now. But if you don't know the full history, and I just found out about, I knew about redlining, but I was like, Harlem? What do you mean? Uh, that was supposed to be the Black right, song, right. Black Mecca. <laughs> like, everybody was supposed to be loving their skin. Yes. You know, so that's what happened. I, I, I had these generations. Mm-hmm. I, I, I feel like I could just let you riff for the next <laughs> half hour. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, you on, you on, you in, you in your flow. I can tell, right? You just kind of, um, we have another question though, and I was also gonna say too, like in terms of that, yeah, because our culture in the United States, especially is like, oh, meritocracy, meritocracy, like self-made man, like you work, if you work for it, you're going to get it, right? And so people have been brainwashed and deluded, all all people brought up in this culture to think like, yeah, you know, this is about like the work that you put in to overcome and survive. And, you know, everybody thinks that it's, you earn what you get. Yes. And we don't want to acknowledge that. No, a lot of people get stuff they did not earn, like since the dawn of time. You get stuff you did not actually earn through your own initiative. <laughs> um, yeah. But our next question from Miss Anna VSW in my culture, Haitian, they always check the ear or the nails, the nail bed of a newborn baby. How do I address such grotesque behavior in a respectful manner? Mm, that's a tough one because when you're dealing with family. Ooh. So any initial thoughts on how you would address that in a respectful manner um it reminds me if anyone if you guys have seen this was like a i think it was, it was either early 2020 or somewhere in 2019 where the youtube star she was mixed she had her darker skin husband and or boyfriend whoever but they had a baby and they kept going on about how dark the baby was going to be and like this was all caught on video because I think they were filming it for their YouTube channel and they just went on and on and on and on and on. And the nurse had to chime in and was like, but isn't she beautiful though? Like to really get them like right and she's like, but isn't and it was a white woman too. I said, you better get them together. But she was like, but isn't she beautiful? Like, cause she was like, are y'all really about to have this whole conversation in front of this new, like newborn baby? Like you're really... And I'm a Christian, so I believe that our words have power. So, like, you're really speaking this over your child who just came into the world. So, it 
you know, I think a way to maybe like, especially in those initial conversations to steer it back to like, but isn't she beautiful? Isn't she adorable? To kind of like steer it away from those kinds of conversations. Um, I would definitely in a different, you know, you don't want to do that in the delivery room, but like maybe in a different setting to really get to the root of why this is such an issue with your like family and uh, elders, you know, it's different in foreign households and like uh, immigrant households and just in foreign places, period, especially uh, people of color, because elders are revered a lot more than they are in a lot of the U.S. in Black culture, because like in the South, very much so. But other places, it's just like, oh, here's my grandma. Okay. It's not as <laughs> like, you know, you don't hold your elders in such a high regard as people from other um, countries do. So it's a little bit more of like, you have to be a lot more tactful and be a lot more respectful, you know, in the way that you bring it up, but bring it up in a concerning, loving, educational way of just being like, you know, if they do say something, well, why did you bring that up? Like, well, why is that such a concern? Um, what if she is dark skin? Why is that such a problem? You know, because a lot of times that will like, because they don't know why it's a problem. They just know that someone else told them it was a problem, so it must be a problem. They don't always know the root of it. It's like, well, do you think that she's not going to be able to get a job? Do you think that she's not going to be able to get married? Like, why is it such an issue if she is dark skin? Yeah, yeah. And because that reminds me of what, you know, your partner in crime, Edlin, said on when he was on live, you know, usually just getting curious and asking questions. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> say that again. What, what, what do you mean by that? You know, like just the simplest questions will catch yep. people off guard because usually they're not used to being questioned. They're used mm -hmm. to everybody else just being like, oh, yeah, girl, what color is she going to be? You know what I mean? Like they're used to people just going along with it. So the, yep. the check smallest, the ears, girl, check them ears. The smallest she's little question will, you know, make people pause. And yes. be like, because mm -hmm. um, half the time they just don't know. They just, like yeah. I said, they've been told by someone or those same questions were asked of them you know yep. like okay well this is what i need to ask this is just how i've been taught that this thing is bad and it's like well why is it bad mm -hmm. yes um okay so we have another question from in satan i hope i'm saying y'all's ig handles right <laughs> y'all know i always talk about that correct me if i mispronounce it greetings from sweden sweden in the house okay i am wondering how one can confront colorist language in the Somali language, the word light skin, Kadi, is also synonymous to being a sweetheart, which is really interesting. So I think this is kind of related, right, mm -hmm. to what the previous question was about, was like, how do you address people when they're saying colorist things? Um, but, but it seems like what N. Satan is saying, that in the Somali language, it's not just making a colorist comment, but just the word itself is colorist, right? Yeah. It's yeah, because then that presents additional layers. It's because it's it's the culture, you know. Like yeah. Um, yeah. when I was researching, this reminds me of like I initially it was going to be for all women of color, and then I was like, this is a lot. I need to to narrow it down. So I researched the origins of colorism for every like ethnic group in a sense, like black people, Asian people, in the Indian community, like all of these things. And so in the Indian community, it is actually ingrained in their religion. So it's one of the only ones that predates colonialism. So it's very hard to tell them that this is wrong when it's ingrained in their religion, just like this word is ingrained in your culture. It's like, how do you change a whole culture's way of saying something? You know, but I think it starts with our families and then goes on from there because you can show out or show and point out, Hey, the way that we say this versus the way that we say this, it literally translates into this person is sweet and this person is not. And I think that there's something wrong with that. And you know, where is the origin of this? You may want to talk to like your elders, your grandmother or whoever, like where is, where does this word come from? Like, why do we use this word to describe lightness? Like where is this stemming from? And hopefully you can be the person or team up with other people to make it an even bigger impact in your community to be like, you know what? 
this is not okay. This is a very colorist statement. It's a very colorist mindset that we have adopted into our language because that's what it is. You guys have adopted this into your language and the way that you speak. Um, how can we then address that? You know, we are trying to get people, I know the continent is, um, for most of the countries are really trying to attack skin bleaching. And it's like, well, if we're using that sweetness as lightness, that is perpetuating the fact that you need to be light to be sweet. And if we're trying to get rid of whitening, we need to get rid of the language, you know? So those kind of things go hand in hand, but definitely having a conversation, um, starting with your family, especially to just find out where the origin is. Um, so then you can kind of attack the root and then kind of go from there and, and take baby steps to be like, okay, we really need to address um, the way that we speak about light-skinned people versus dark-skinned people. Because um, a lot of times it's just, that's what they say. So it's like, you don't see nothing wrong with it. It's just like, this is what we call them. Yes. Um, the follow-up comment, oh my goodness, they used to say, if it ain't light, it ain't right. Wow. That is... <clears throat> <laughs> And then Chase Freedom NYC, people in Hawaii assumed I was in the military due to my skin complexion. Of my skin in 2020, I was in Hawaii for college and asked them, why do you assume I'm in the military? They were so ashamed. So they, they, did, they weren't gonna assume that you were getting there, going there to get educated, right? They're like, well, if you are here, you have to be in the military. You can't just be here. Can't just be you here. Know what I mean? Why are you here? Yeah. Yeah. It's like that question when you see um, a black person in college, or oh, you must be on the basketball team. <laughs> the assumption right. that you can't just be in college to learn, like you gotta be, you must be an athlete, right? Or any any yeah. black person. Oh, you got here on scholarship. Mm. <laughs> that's that's the only way I can get in. That's the only <laughs> way. I can, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. And it's interesting that you um, talked about texturism and how you saw, you know, yourself as being more on the privileged end of that spectrum, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, Yeah. right? In terms of like, where do you see, like what aspects of your identity do you feel like, you know, you're more privileged? And the reason why I ask that is because um, in having these conversations, I think it's important to model for people, mm -hmm. like A, that we all have some form of privilege, right? Yeah. And then to show people like ways to unpack their privilege and just to be able to see people like, okay, yeah, this was a form of privilege for me, but it doesn't take away from things I have worked for. It doesn't take away from, you know, my successes or my accomplishments. Yeah. Um, and like, for me, I always talk about like being thin or, you know, not being plus size and that being a huge one, right? In terms of what a lot of dark skinned women go through, but then also having body shaming issues around that. Yeah. Um, so you can either uh, like touch back on that topic in terms of like what aspects of your identity do you feel um, have been sources of privilege for you, but also any additional advice for people who need to, you know, kind of just get themselves together and say, okay, yeah. yes, I, I do have privilege. <laughs> Um, I would definitely say, like I said before, my hair, um, you can't really tell right now, but my hair is very wavy and it just kind of like curls on the end. Um, so when I, I did a big chop, I thought that, you know, we had everyone seen the big chop videos. If you went natural, um, I went natural, I think in like 2010, but I thought mm -hmm. I was going to have these little curls. I was like, Ooh, I'm about to be cute. I'm about to cut all my hair off. I'm about to have all these little curls. No one told me at the time that them little curls was only for like 4C hair, okay? So I didn't have no little curls. Like, I thought I was gonna have all these little curls on top of my hair. My hair was straight. And I was like, what is going on? But that's because my, my curl pattern is wavy, so it didn't start to curl up until it grew out. And I was like, oh, there it is. But your girl was out here basically with a buzz cut. Anyways, so recognize my privilege with my hair i'm also on the thinner side um so i can definitely recognize privilege with that because i don't really work out i don't do anything like that so i feel bad when anyone asks me what my workout regimen is i'm like i just got good genes i'm sorry um and also now that i have when i lived in new york i got shades lighter than i was growing up like you can see pictures of me when i was younger i was a lot darker so it kind of catches me off guard because now people will ask me like 
I've been asked several times, like, so you consider yourself a dark skinned woman? And I'm like, I'm, but that's how I'm, I'm sorry, what? Like, and I didn't realize that people didn't see me that way until people started asking me that. So now I understand that's a privilege that I have just by, ha like, I didn't make this happen. I wasn't bleaching my skin or anything like that. It's just, I grew up in California, loved the sun, was always in the sun went to New York, there's really barely any direct sunlight. And I started to get lighter. I was like, what is going on? It is what it is. But you know, I can't, what am I gonna do about it? I can't do that about it. So, um, but recognizing my privilege in that it is a lot harder sometimes because I am fighting for an experience that I have that some, some certain people don't feel as though I have the right to fight for now because they don't see me as a dark skin person. Um, and I also recognize my privilege as a dark skinned person when I see people darker than me, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't have to go through things that probably someone, not probably, but someone like Lupita when finding makeup, you know what I'm saying? Because if they don't go to their shade, they probably go to mine, you know what I'm saying? So like, there's a lot of privileges that come with even on the spectrum of darker skin to where it's like, okay, yeah. I know that I'm not as dark over here. So there are some privileges that I have that this person probably does not have. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when you break it down that way and understand that it's on so many different levels, it's not a monolithic thing. Like once you're dark skin, this is where you're at. Like there's so many mm -hmm. different things like we talked about with featurism and everything like that. Where it's like, if you have a thinner nose and thinner lips or just more Eurocentric beauty features, you're on a different spectrum than someone who doesn't have those features or someone with a looser curl pattern is on a different spectrum than someone who doesn't. So um, understanding that there's, as people say, levels to this ish and not just like a monolithic <laughs> experience. <laughs> Yes, yes. And I I see I resonate with that, you know, because Edwin was like, Oh yeah, you and Raven will be have a great conversation. And I was like, You were right, you were right. Because I also I remember like earlier when I first started blogging about colorism, I was on this um radio program with this woman and we were talking before the show and I was like, Yeah, you know, because I grew up, you know, as a dark scene girl. She was like, Yeah, but I've seen your pictures and you're not dark. You're not that dark, right? Similar though, like, yeah, when I was younger, I was actually even darker than I appear now. Yeah. Right? I was night, like, like my little chubby thighs, you know, <laughs> like really dark. But, and I was also talking to someone else and saying how like, yeah, you know, me and my friends were all dark skins, but they're not as dark as me. Mm -hmm. So they don't really understand what I'm going through. You know yeah. what I mean? So I definitely, 100%, like even amongst dark skinned people, there are people who are darker that will be ostracized even more, right? Yeah. And I remember on one of the shows that Oprah did after Dark Girls aired, she had this little talk with Inyama Van Zant, And so she asked the question, she said, is it, you know, dark skin or light skin or is it lighter than, mm -hmm. right? And when you think about certain contexts, right, where everybody's kind of dark skin, like just the, the person who's lighter than everybody else. Even yeah. if they would still be considered dark in the larger world, it's like, well, you're lighter than the rest of us. Um, and so you have privilege or you're seen as more beautiful or more attractive. And so I definitely agree with that. Um, there's, there's one comment from Issa Trey. Issa mm -hmm. Trey uh, left several comments. Sometimes I think people can't acknowledge privileges without reminding people, but I'm still black. And it's like, that's not the point. Exactly. Like, no one... And it's almost like to be black means to be completely disenfranchised in every way, in every sense yeah. of the word, right? But we know that we don't all experience racism the same way just because we're black. We don't all show up in our experiences of blackness in the same way. And yeah. I, was, again, was telling this, saying this on Sunday, how, like, even your gender is going to impact the way you experience racism, right? Like... Yes, we all experience it, but as a man, as a black man, you're going to experience it in ways that are unique to that experience versus yeah. being a black woman, right? Where it's intersecting with sexism and all that as well. Um, so I think I'm going to wind down with one last question. Mm -hmm. um, this has been thrilling, but I don't want to keep you too long. 
And I don't see any other questions in the chat. So we'll <laughs> take this opportunity. We'll like jump in and try to pose the last question. Um, what would you offer in terms of advice for two groups of people, knowing that people might fall into both groups, mm -hmm. for people who want to do work on their own healing, right? To make progress in their own personal healing around colorism. And then also for people who want to become advocates or who want to do advocacy work and be activists and maybe start their own initiatives. So what kind of um, parting words can you offer for people in terms of that? I would say first, um, anyone who wants to do the healing work within themselves, um, it's just so many different things, whether you're trying to recognize your own colorist behavior or if you're trying to heal from colors behavior that have been towards you. Um, one, you have to take a step back. You have to understand if someone has been colorist towards you, it's not you, it's them. That's first and foremost. Like, And that's one of the things where we really want people to own who they say they are and not what the world says about them because the world is skewed. The world has a very skewed view on what beauty is, on what intelligence looks like and all of these things. So you kind of have to take a step back and understand that those things do not define you. Those things are not who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just so many things that make up so many different people. I would say when you're trying to recognize colorist behavior in yourself and it's with everyone, like dark skinned women being on the end of the spectrum is not like exempt from colorist views, mm -hmm. whether it's who yes. they find attractive in a mate or what have you like or seeing a light-skinned woman and thinking that she's prettier than her darker skin counterpart like we've all been indoctrinated with this view of the world so taking a step back i know for myself when it comes to like looking at men and finding them attractive this is so crazy but like i have to check my own biases because i'm like let me make sure that i'm not tripping because of the world that I grew up in. So if I see a guy and I'm like, oh, he's fine. I make sure that he's fine on both spectrums. I'm like, if this is dark skin, <laughs> would I think he was fine? Yes, check. It, and it usually pans out. Like, I've never been like, no, I don't think I was. Like, it's never that, but I know the imagery that I've been fed. I know the things that I have been indoctrinated with. So I have to create an extra lens sometimes to make sure that I'm viewing the world without colorist eyes you know what i'm saying i'm fighting colorism but that doesn't exempt me from having traces of colorist behavior because i've, I've recognized that colorism exists that doesn't that doesn't happen okay so um i would say just take a step back take a step back from your own experience as well and just be like you know what what has happened to other people outside of the experiences that i've even faced whether it's your or what have you, like, okay, let me take a step back and understand that, yes, I have had to go through X, Y, and Z, but this person and their counterparts have had to go through A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like, all of these other things that I have not had to experience, you know? And if it's the simplest thing is, if you have never been called pretty for a dark-skinned girl, you have privilege, okay? It could be as simple as that. So... Even if you don't think that you have privilege, if you have never been called that or never had those words said to you, there's a privilege that you have that I do not. So just understanding that people's experiences are different outside of your own. When it comes to, um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, um, for people who want to do their own ag advocacy work or maybe start initiatives in their communities and spaces. I would definitely say um, start in your household, start with your friend group, um, start working even bigger out of that once you can. Um, finding people who also feel the way that you feel about this issue. So if you talk to your friends and they're like, yeah, this is the issue, or you have another friend that's like, yes, this is something that we need to talk about. Um, I'm probably, this is probably the same with you, uh, Dr. Webb. When I first started re researching colorism, it was the undiscussed ism. You have to realize that we've just been talking about colorism for the last couple of years. This has not been a thing that's been discussed in the black community and it's still not being discussed. So understanding going into this space to tackle something that people still do not want to address, you know, on a wide spectrum and still feel very hurt by certain things because there's a lot of things that I've experienced that I was like I didn't know that this was going to hurt somebody that we did this or that somebody was going to feel this way about this um so understanding that join conversations on clubhouse clubhouse is great I think there's another 
app now kind of similar to Clubhouse called Quilt. I think it's called um, listening to podcasts. Do the research is the thing. Like you really want to find out what's the history behind it? Where did it come from? What is the, you know, documentation to back these things up? Because you just, you don't want to go out and be like, I'm fighting for something. And it's like, well, how does this impact your community? I don't know, but I know it's bad. <laughs> Ain't nobody gonna listen to you. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody is going to be like, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> you gotta continue to do the research, see what's going on, see what's out there. Um, if you're in D.C. or can go to D.C., I recommend going to the Library of Congress. That's where I went um, when I started. I really wanted to research the doll test um, and see basically mm -hmm. like their thesis or their um, not their thesis, but like what they thought the outcome was going to be was not what the outcome was. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. So why? What happened? Um, but if you're not familiar with the doll test, it's just basically like. They had a white doll, a black doll. The black doll was bad. The white doll was good. And da, da, da. Um, yeah. So, you know, they did this when they were fighting uh, se segregation in schools. So that was the whole thing about that. But it's definitely great research to really look at to see um, how students who were in non-segregated schools felt about it versus students who were in segregated schools. And the craziness is, students in segregated schools actually pick the black doll more than they pick the white doll. So that's another reason why, you know, segregation was not the best thing for black people. But that's, again, an unpopular opinion. But that's basically what it was in their findings back then, um, that a lot of students, black students in integrated schools actually pick the white doll instead of the black doll. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, but just research, research, research so that when you do have these conversations, because you will, and you'll encounter people who don't want to have the conversation, who want to negate that it's a thing. And then it's more than just, like we said, pretty versus unpretty. You want to have the research mm -hmm. and the stats to back it up. Even if it's just like simple stats, it doesn't have to be a whole dissertation, but you want to have something to, to be like, well, no, it actually affects this, 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 and this. Oh, okay. So. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Raven Roberts, for this very um, energizing, stimulating conversation, dropping all yes. kind of gems on us. Um, and so you can follow Raven Roberts at Own Your I Am. Um, and if, you, if you're watching live, I always tell people in the top left-hand corner, you just click on the names at the top of the screen. A drop-down menu will appear, and you can click on On Your I Am right now and follow. Um, okay. But if you're watching the recording, I will also tag um, the account as well. Um, and so I also want to remind people that the Colorism Healing Writing Contest is Underway, it ends April 30th. So do submit your poems, essays, short stories, that kind of thing. And I'll be back next week, Tuesday at 2. I have another guest, actually, Noir Femininity. Hopefully yes. we can still make it. Um, but yeah, I always love these lives. Thank you all so much in the comments for your questions and your feedback and your own sharing, your own perspective. This was great. Yay. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Yes. Enjoy the rest of your week, Thank everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it was Bye. great. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>